Welcome to General Sir Cyril Brudenell White. Thanks for giving us some of your valuable time to answer these 10 questions about your life in the Army. My pleasure, Will. Thanks for having me. Brudenell, would you be able to tell me a bit about your childhood and your family? I was born on the 23rd of September 1876 in Victoria at St. Arnold. My mum's Maria Nee Gibson and my dad's John Warren. They're both born in Dublin. In 1881, we moved to Queensland, where we lived on pastoral stations in the Gladstone, Charter Towers and Gympie areas. Shortly after, we settled down in Clayfield, Brisbane, where I was educated at Eton Preparatory School for one year in Nunda and until I dropped out at Brisbane Central's Boys School. As a job, I'd always dreamed of being a barrister with my great-grandfather. However, at the age of 16, I decided that I'd work as a bank clerk. This allowed me to study in my spare time. Did you have any previous experience of war before World War I? If so, where did you serve and what roles did you play? In 1896, I decided to join the Colonial Militia Force in Queensland. It's an army where we served for the state, as there wasn't an Australian army at the time. I then served for the Australian Commonwealth Horse in the Second Boer War, where we were a mounted infantry unit for the Australian Army. I was one of the people who founded the Australian Army in 1901. I was the very first officer for Australia to attend the British Army Staff College in 1906. The final role I played was the Director of Military Operations. Would you be able to tell me a bit about how and why you enlisted? Also, is it true that you are offered the role Chief of Staff for the Australian Army when enlisting? I enlisted on the 15th August 1914, where I was offered the role Chief of Staff for the AIF, or Australian Imperial Force, by William Bridges mainly for having a lot of experience war with war previous to World War I. The role of the job was to work behind the scenes of the army. I had to deal with the current issues, mediate disputes and solve problems before they were brought to the chief executive. I understand that the conditions were tough in Gallipoli and at the Western Front, but would you be able to tell me how bad they really were? Well, the conditions were so unbelievably bad. The machine gun and rifle fire, bombing, shelling and the artillery gave many of us physiological and psychological problems. Some effects of this are lack of sleep, hearing impairment, stress from the deafening mechanical noises and finally shell shock. Lack of sleep meant that many soldiers were falling asleep on the post. Us Anzacs were in a horrible situation when arriving at Gallipoli and were under constant shell fire. This and everything else mentioned caused daily deaths, which created terrible stenches throughout the trenches. So Brudenell, you just told me that the conditions were devastating at Gallipoli and at the Western Front. Can you tell me about the training the Anzacs were put through to prepare for this? In Egypt, us Anzacs were put through hours of intense training a day to prepare, prepare for war. The environment was described by soldiers as dull and dust, dust, dust. All training was done with harsh surroundings and the drills involved were drill parades, field exercises, weapons practice, tent pitching, stretcher drills and route marches. In the heat, these drills put us to the test. At first, we were going to send soldiers in air to areas in Europe and to the Western Front, but we decided that we'd assist our allies in Gallipoli. The hard work paid off for many, but for some not at all, as some were shot straight away off after getting off the boat. Can you tell me a bit about the food and drink Anzacs were given in Gallipoli and at the Western Front, as well as some diseases people caught throughout World War I? The food us Anzacs had to eat was barely edible, and the water was scarce and poor quality. The main drink between soldiers was very strong black tea, however, many Anzacs were still dehydrated. Our diet consisted of fruit and vegetables, which weren't fresh, processed meat, hard biscuits, and condensed milk and cocoa for our sugar intake. Due to the small rations we lived off, many people were vulnerable to health problems. There weren't any bathing stations, meaning that there was a lack of sanitization, 
which led to a rapid spread of dysentery. Can you please tell me a bit about each of the commissioned officer ranks you held throughout World War I and what was the role of each position? At the start of the war, I was the acting chief of general staff for the AIF, which I talked about earlier. I then held the rank of a lieutenant colonel, which I was responsible for the overall operational effectiveness of my unit when coming to discipline, welfare and military capability. I became a major general on the 1st of January 1918, where I controlled formations of division sizes. I was also offered to be in command of the Australian Corps, where I would have been in charge of 109,881 men, but I said no. Can you name a few of the most important awards you've been given and which ones are the most special to you? Can you also tell me about your greatest moment in World War I? The major awards I earned were the Order of the Bath, the Distinguished Service Order, the Croix de Guerre, and mentioned in Dispatches. I think my greatest achievement is having the title of Sir or being mentioned in Dispatches multiple times for my heroic actions. This is for my service at Gallipoli and at the Western Front. I'd say my greatest moment is making a name for Australia by partly organising the landing at Anzac Cove, Gallipoli, which didn't go to plan. However, after 26,111 Anzac casualties with 8,141 deaths from Gallipoli alone, an evacuation plan was arranged, in which I was accorded with much of the credit due to its success. How has your view and your comrades' view on war changed from the beginning of your career until now? What are some effects that war has on people? Many soldiers enlisted as they thought it had been an enjoyable experience to travel the world. However, this will change when the horrendous conditions were discovered, as well as the gunshots and explosions. Over all the deafening noises, the wounded screams were heard for a few yards of trench. Someone described it as like being dressed up with nowhere to go. We were ready to die, but had nothing worth dying for. Though die we did, and in hundreds. After war, there were many cases of sh shell shock, which is thought to be caused by exposure of artillery bombardments and wounded mines. People constantly dying and being wounded caused these, this to happen. Final question, Brudenow. So, we're heading into World War II now, and you've just enlisted in the second AIF. What have you done from the end of World War I until now? After the war had finished, I still wanted to help the country. When arriving home, I received my awards from Gallipoli and the Western Front, but then went back to being a Lieutenant Colonel. I then joined a committee which talked about the future of the AIF. This was run by myself and many other highly ranked officers from World War I. In 1920, I was honoured to organise a tour for the Prince of Wales. I, was, I joined more committees and boards for several years, but, I, but then after declining another term on the service board, I decided to retire. However, after, the, after enlisting for the second day I, I can't wait to serve for my country again. Well, Brudenow, that's all we have for today. Thanks so much for answering these questions about your amazing time serving for Australia so far. You're welcome, Will. It was a pleasure being here.